Jonathan Lear, a professor of philosophy and social thought at the University of Chicago, takes the case of an American Indian nation, the Crow, and their last great chief, Plenty Coos, who died an old man in 1932, having lived through the complete upheaval of Crow life and culture. Plenty Coos was at home on the reservation, now the fifth biggest in the United States, when, at the age of 80, he told his story to a white sign-talker or writer. But Radical Hope is not a work of anthropology. It's about behaving bravely and finding hope in the face of the loss of your cult. The very culture that gives meaning to your ideas of hope and of courage. It's a way of asking how we should all live our lives, given that our own cultures always have the potential to collapse. And to talk about this... Jonathan Lear joins us on the line from Chicago. Jonathan, uh, you tell us that you've been haunted by something that Plenty Coos said when being interviewed towards the end of his life by a white person. Plenty Coups would not or could not speak about anything after his nation moved onto a reservation, and he told the interviewer, I can think back and tell you much more of war and horse stealing, but when the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground, and they could not lift them up again. After this, nothing happened. I guess we can't be sure what he meant by saying nothing happened. Uh, what do you think he might have meant? One of the reasons I thought this might be a, a way in for a, a philosophical inquiry is that precisely that I didn't know for sure what he meant. One thing I found out about myself was I heard this phrase, I guess, about 25 years ago, and the phrase never left my imagination. It would just come back to me on... Uh, walks and hikes and, and whatever. And after 25 years, I realized that this phrase is, is haunting me and I ought to try and think about it. And what I thought one could do from a philosophical point of view would be, instead of to trying to find out what Plenty Coup really meant, to carry out a thought experiment and to imagine what he might have meant if he were standing witness to something true. Instead of interpreting him as speaking metaphorically, uh, as though he's uh, saying that he's depressed or uh, nothing was worth happening or various psychological claims that, you know, he might well have meant, uh, instead to interpret him as, say, as to trying to record as a witness a very peculiar happening, which would be the ceasing of events as they were understood. Can you just very briefly give us some idea of what events had happened as, as they might occur, uh, perhaps not to Plenty Coup, but to an external observer? I mean, we know that the buffalo had gone. What, what else had happened? Well, overall, there was a you know there's a terrible onslaught of uh, you know what we now call Western civilization onto the, you know across uh, the Northwest Plains, uh, especially after the Civil War. There was an attempt to very strong attempt to do uh, from you know the the U.S. point of view to domesticate this land and make it part of the larger American uh, continent. But for those who were already living there, the indigenous peoples, it was just an utter devastation. Firstly, I mean, as you as you alluded to, not only were you know the buffalo had been around 1850, there were I think about 50 million buffalo roaming the Northwest Plains, and by you know the 1890s, about 40 years later, there were about a thousand left, and uh, this was the basis of the way of life of all these peoples. But I mean, the crow actually, in terms of the way they were treated, they were treated by comparison relatively well with respect to how, you know, the appalling way that other tribes were treated. But uh, I, I think it's, you know, a very familiar story, a very sad and also outrageous story about uh, the treatment of, of these peoples, of uh, the Plains tribes. But the Crow, actually, from my point of view, are, are a very interesting case because on the one hand, they made a decision based on a dream vision that this 
young man uh, when he was nine years old, uh, Plenty Coup. I call him Plenty Coup. He's also called Plenty Coups, as you, as, as you call him. Uh, this young man went out and had a dream vision, and on the basis of that vision, the tribe decided or realized, this was about 1850, the elders in the tribe interpreted his dream vision, and the interpretation was that their traditional way of life was going to come to an end. And they made a decision about their foreign policy, which actually is still in effect today, which is that they would ally with the U.S. government and fight on the U.S. government's side against their enemy in the Indian Native American tribes. And when they moved on to a reservation, they moved on to the reservation, you know, voluntarily. I mean, they were in, uh, you know, there were conditions of hunger and deprivation. But one of the interesting things about this particular case is that in many ways, the main thing they lost was their traditional culture. While their, you know, their bodies remained relatively intact, I mean, there was they, they caught white man's diseases. There were things like that, but they were never defeated in a war. So, but what they nevertheless lost was their traditional way of life and all of the the rituals, the symbols, and the meanings that went along with it. Well, yes, and we'll, we'll return to the dream uh, shortly because it was obviously very important, but. Just talking about the traditional life, a way into that might be by way of what Plenty Coup's name means. Well, the coup, uh, the word coup comes from the French, uh, and uh, some French entered into an argot of uh, French, English, and traditional um, uh, Indian language, uh, meaning a blow. And uh, to say that he's plenty coup means he's somebody who is capable or did uh, carry out many coups, struck many coups. And in the Northwest Plains, fighting was traditional among the Crow, but also their major enemies, the Sioux, the Lakota, were a a traditional enemy of theirs, that a mark of real bravery. I mean, there were various ways that you could count coup. But one of the paradigm ways that you that you could do it was that in battle, if you had a stick, which was your coup stick, and instead of just trying to kill your enemy, one of the marks of bravery would be to strike your enemy with a coup stick, and the, there then would be this moment of recognition between these two fighters, and then you would try to kill the enemy. But it was taken to be a very brave thing to do. Other ways to count coup would be to like sneak into the enemy settlement and steal their horses and, and get them back to, to to, to one's own. There were various things that you could do, but that was the, the paradigm would be striking a, a, another warrior uh, with the coup stick. I, I guess the other really important paradigm that was that in battle, the, uh, the, the crow would divide up into clans that, and the leader of the clan would go into battle with his coup stick. And if he planted his coup stick in the ground, that was a point of land from which he would never retreat. He would never, he would give up his life rather than give up that piece of ground. So again, that was seen as a, as a major act of, of bravery and was rewarded as such among the crow. Once the Crow were on the reservation and the government had banned into tribal warfare, the whole point of counting coups was lost. But it's not just that. A lot of cultural practices, even something that seems as basic as cooking, had ceased to have meaning, didn't they? Well, I think they did. And I think the way you can start to see this is if you try and put it into a a contemporary cultural situation. You know, you can be at somebody's home and somebody is over the stove and they're, they're obviously cooking, but you say, you know, what's up? And the answer is something like, well... I'm getting the kids ready for to be able to do a night's homework, or I'm, uh, I, w- I want to get this over with. So because what we're we're getting ready to uh, to go out this evening to the movies, you don't actually have to say you're cooking a hamburger or whatever it is you are cooking. It's it's clear that you're doing that. But what y- the answer to the question what what you're doing is embedded in a larger context that makes sense of why you're doing this obvious event now. And that, I think, is it's that surrounding aura of uh, meanings that gives the even the most basic human activities, like cooking a meal meaning, that was stripped away. So that, for instance, an example I use in the book is if in 1820 you walked by a teepee and uh, a, a woman was out over a pot, over a fire, somebody could say the crow equivalent of what's up, and the answer would be, well, we're going on a hunt tomorrow, or... Um, all sorts of things that would be the answer to the question of what are you doing. And all of that got 
ripped away, really, in this case, more or less overnight. So even as simple an activity as uh, cooking a meal became uh, stripped of the, of the larger environment in which it would uh, normally get its meaning. Now, you employ not just in your book, you employ not just uh, crow notions, but you you look at Aristotle's ideas of the virtues, which are very important to your thinking about radical hope, which is the subject of the book. How is Aristotle useful when it comes to looking at a culture that's facing devastation? Well, the larger question that I was and am thinking about is how do you face with, let's say, dignity or integrity or courage the collapse of the traditional values in which you've been brought up, in particular traditional understandings of courage or dignity or integrity. And one of the things about Aristotle I find, I mean, it's basically the ancient Greek tradition I find very fascinating. Aristotle's exemplary of it is that Aristotle thought that early childhood training is a very, very important part of the laying down of character and that one needs to think about ethical life in terms of uh, what they called the virtues or human excellences or ways of flourishing as a human being. And so something like being courageous was a way of uh, living, of facing the future that was for Aristotle, Plato, um, the other Greek thinkers, a truly excellent way of being a human being. Part of their view of what the human condition is like is that, you know, all sorts sorts of things may happen in the future. and You don't know exactly which ones uh, they're going to be, but part of that early training and in, in childhood training is teaching you to face up to, you know, no matter what happens, whatever thing comes your way, you'll be able to face it with some kind of dignity or in- integrity or, or, in this case, courage. But now, if that's sort of the structure of our psyches, if we are trained to sort of face different possibilities, we don't know which one, but trying to face different possibilities as they arise well, then the question arises, what happens if if one's training about a whole field of possibilities, the kinds of things that might happen in the future, if all of that collapses, that it's not just about facing up to this event or that event, but your whole sense of like what what are the various things that might be happening, the whole field of events of what might the future look like, that that collapses. Now, this becomes, I think, a, you know, an enormously interesting, both an enormously interesting philosophical problem and relatedly a very important, I think, interesting psychological problem, which is, again, if you, with Plato and Aristotle, believe that, you know, your soul, your psyche is, that's the Greek word, is is shaped by, in, in, in a very sort of firm way in early childhood, then part of the challenge of facing up to these cultural moments of crisis and catastrophe is how do you actually change the shape of your own psyche that's been you you yourself have been brought up to sort of look on the future as having this realm of possibilities and it's precisely this sense of the realm of possibilities that has uh, collapsed on abc radio national you're listening to the philosopher's zone i'm talking to jonathan lear from the university of chicago about his book radical hope ethics in the face of cultural devastation. Jonathan, one possible reaction to the sudden radical loss of these cultural possibilities is simply to fight against them. The Sioux, traditional enemies of the Crow, under Chief Sitting Bull, they more or less elected to go down fighting, which was very different to what the Crow did, wasn't it? Yes, and and the debate about that still continues. I spend a fair amount of time up on the Crow Reservation, which is up in Montana, and the debates about these different decisions goes on, and I expect it, it will continue to go on. And I think humans of honor and humans of courage can make decisions on either side of this debate. I was very interested in trying to make an unusual case, something that sort of goes against the grain of many sort of uh, heroic narratives of resistance that the crow had actually found a way 
to behave with what I think of as integrity, dignity, and courage in the face of the collapse in the future, while nevertheless trying to survive as a culture in, in radically altered circumstances. I want to say this is a very contentious claim, and it's a very, uh, it's a very fraught claim. The Crow, among other tribal groups, the, you know, among Lakota uh, Sue, I have talked to. I mean, the Crow are, are seen as collaborators, where collaborator is used in the standard pejorative sense of like collaborating with the Nazis and are, are looked down upon for having done that. And uh, Plenty Coups, <laughs> guided by his dream, he's clearly a man of great foresight as well as courage because he's trying to be a Crow chief while understanding that the world is no longer one in which it's possible to be a chief in the way that the Crow have understood what a chief is. I agree. And one of the things I, I want to stress that it's from the Crow point of view, n not just back then but now, his dream was a dream vision. From their point of view, uh, it had a divine source. In the book, I just remain completely agnostic about the question of where it came from. I'm more interested in once they had it, how was it used? Uh, you know, Plenty Coup ushered the, the tribe through a transitional period into a tribal future where it was no longer clear what anybody could do to become a chief. But not only that, and this is why the issue radical comes in, it no longer made – real sense to know what it would mean to be a chief. What does it even mean when you say that you are one? But the the reason I wanted to mention the issue about it being a dream vision and that it was taken to have a divine source is that I think that that gave Plenty Coup the ability to think of what he was doing in terms of and, – and the tribe as well – to think of what he was doing in terms of fidelity to a religious call. And in that sense, I mean, one of the, the – in the background of my book, I mean, you mentioned Aristotle, but Kierkegaard is also a huge influence on me. I saw in Plenty Coup somebody who was challenged to hold on to a certain vision of the future that was given in a dream vision and, you know, the, the interpretation of that dream vision. And as such, he is a – I think a very remarkable figure of somebody who's going to sort of project himself into a future as a chief at a time when it no longer made sense to be a chief and it was very unclear what it would what it would be. The account of the dream um, as you give it in the book, it's rather involved and complicated, <laughs> but basically what was there in the dream that was showing him what might be the way forward? You know, there, there are two major features in the dream vision um, as I hear it. The first part of it was one that was interpreted as predicting the end of their traditional civilization. It was a dream about a, a terrible storm in the forest where every tree in the forest is knocked down except for one. But the second part of the dream vision concentrates on the one standing tree. And the standing tree was called the tree of the chickadee. And the chickadee is a um, – it's a bird of the, of the northwest plains and, I mean, it does have differential bird calls that are thought by the crow both to be linked to changing weather patterns and also to be linked to the size of predators nearby, whether there are predators nearby, whether they're big or they're small. And so the chickadee was traditionally taken to be a very smart bird. In the dream vision, this chickadee is – telling the young Plenty Coup that this is the new model of, of how life uh, should be lived, that you should follow the, the wisdom of the chickadee. The kind of wisdom they have is a kind of second order wisdom. It's not that they possess a certain content of, of truths that they are going to teach, but that they can recognize when others have wisdom and that they can learn and open themselves up to the wisdom of others. You've said that you're agnostic as to the question of the of the divine origins of Plenty Coup's dream, but given that he believed that it was of divine origin, doesn't that make it easier for him to be courageous, given that this seems to be an optimism founded on religious faith? Well, I, th I, I think that's right. For me, the, the, the point that's um, interesting about that is that it's nevertheless left completely open even what the correct dogmatic beliefs of religious belief are. 
Uh, this is, I think, a crucial point. Uh, there's some kind of an absolute guidance being given here, but it's not as though he is sure of the right concepts in which that guidance should be conceptualized or understood. I mean, it is true as a biographical fact about him, uh, he ended up converting to Catholicism uh, on the reservation and married in, in a Catholic church in St. Xavier's church, which is sort of in the middle of the reservation. He never gave up his Crow beliefs either. He felt that these were compatible. But my sense is that what is really being adhered to here is a kind of commitment to the idea that human concepts at any given point in time are vulnerable, and including human concepts of the good, the divine, these things are finite and vulnerable themselves, but that there's nevertheless some kind of commitment to the goodness of the world that transcends our current understanding or the, our current concepts in which we, we could describe them. That's, I think, what makes it, philo- you know, one of the things that makes it really philosophically interesting is a kind of uh, sense of, well, we might not have the concepts yet, but there can nevertheless be a, a committed sense to it would be worth continuing to live and form new concepts to figure out how best to understand ourselves and the world we inhabit. The philosopher Ernest Gellner said that Western man in modern times was modular, and by that he meant modular in the way that some furniture can be modular. You know, you turn this chair into one third of a sofa, you move things around and so on. And now this suggests that our concepts, the concepts we deal, are more loosely put together than those of the crow. They're not thickly embedded in the way that those of the crow are. Do you think that's true? And do you think that means that our scientific culture is conceptually, not just materially, more resilient than that of a people like the crow? I do think that it's more resilient, absolutely. But I don't think that the problem is transcended or that it's no longer a problem. You know, I think it's quite common for us to think of ourselves as having uh, multiple identities, that there isn't one identity that's ours. And I think actually one of the reasons my neighbor, uh, Barack Obama, was elected was uh, a valorization of that idea. There's he you know, there's no one thing he is. He's Hawaiian. He's, you know, Kenyan. He's American. He's black. He's white. He actually, by the way, was adopted into the Crow Nation. So he's also Crow. He's Barack Black Eagle. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's both a familiar and valorized idea today that there are many identities we have, and if one identity is threatened, we can just sort of focus in on the others. It's like sort of having your wealth in a basket of currencies, which, you know, these days, uh, who, who knows whether it's a good idea or not. But I think the the issue of finiteness and vulnerability of our concepts is one that just goes straight to the human condition, and nothing is going to be able to transcend that completely. But I think, you know, actually the, the metaphor of uh, holding your identity in a basket of currencies is an interesting one, because at a time like the current one, it's not really clear how resilient they're going to be. And so the idea that you have uh, some of your wealth and a lot of them, well, what happens if, you know, the entire idea of currency starts to come under threat because people aren't willing to exchange it. Well, the book is called Radical Hope, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation. I've been talking to the author, Jonathan Lear. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And the music you've been hearing this week isn't, I'm afraid, the music of the Crow Nation. Instead, it comes from their traditional enemies, the Sioux or Lakota. <laughs> 